good evening to everyone. And thank you for uh, being uh, with us for the CEPREPA uh, seminar, Le Mardi du CEPREPA. So today we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Lorraine Delan uh, for a presentation titled Kuwait in the Age of Postmodernity, Visual Culture and Urban Transformation since 1950. So Laura is a postdoc a researcher at the University of Bern in the Department of Art History. And she's the author of the book, Iridescent Kuwait, Retro Modernity and Urban Visual Culture since the mid 20th century. So it's a book that was published in 2022. And um, it is a transdisciplinary uh, study exploring the intersection of urban development, visual culture, contemporary art and petroleum industrialization in the Arab Gulf region. So Laura also recently co-edited the special issue uh, Urban Cultures in the Gulf uh, from an historical media perspective in the Middle East Journal of Culture and Communication, also in 2022. And she has published articles on architecture, magazine culture, and contemporary art of the Arabian Peninsula, and especially Kuwait. Uh, Laura is also board member of uh, Manazir, which is the Swiss platform for the study of visual art, architecture, and heritage in the MENA region, and an editorial member of Manazir Journal. So Laura will present your research for about 30 minutes. And then after, we will keep some time for the Q&A with, uh, with everyone. So feel free to start whenever you are ready. Many thanks, Ossian, for the kind introduction. And also, um, my thanks goes to uh, the Sefrepa and also Makram for inviting me today and um, being able to present my work to you. Just going to open the presentation. So yes, again, a warm welcome also from my side. Um, I'm happy to speak to you um, today about my book that came out at the beginning of this year um, with the title Iridescent uh, Kuwait. Um, that's the table of contents. And um, in the following 30 minutes, I will guide you through sort of um, the main chapters and some of my findings. Um, a few words um, up front. Um, in this book, I, I deal with different groups of visual material, mostly from the 1950s and 60s. Um, during my research process, I was particularly interested in this moment of change when Kuwait became an oil producing state starting from 1946 with actual export to its declaration of independence in 1961. And the relationship between petroleum and visual culture or images um, in the sense that um, for a long time there have been studies on the impact of petroleum on the Arabian uh, Gulf region in, in economy, in politics, in history, but hardly ever um, in art history or architectural history. And um, for me, that was quite interesting to yeah, follow traces of images and see how that, um, how that rupture, how that urban transformation is played out in images and what role as like active agents images play in this process, so vice versa. And I'm just gonna dive right in. Ah, and maybe one thing up front, um, sort of these, the three, I, I think you will see my arrows sort of, um, the, these are the three main chapters. So number three, four and five, where I actually discuss that historical material from the 1950s and 1960s. And there's kind of like a bracket function or bracket structure of my book, where I talk about contemporary artworks in chapter one, kind of like six and seven. Um, because for me, it was important to also get a perspective on how, um, what role do these images play today? So is there an engagement within? What kind of engagement? How is that petromodernity and sort of petroculture reflected in contemporary, um, in the contemporary period? And for me, contemporary art proved to be really a fruitful um, yeah, base to, to trace that dialogue in, in our contemporary period. So this is what I'm going to start with. The photograph shows a giant sculpture by Kuwaiti artist Munir Al-Kadiri. It lies stranded on the sandy shores of the Gulf like a meteorite uh, fallen down um, from the space. The sculpture has the form of a drill, blown up drill bit and it used to sit within the premises of the Shindaga Heritage Village in Dubai. 
the object is made of fiberglass and then carefully coated with layers of iridescent varnish, just like a car. Its smooth surface shimmers mysteriously, oscillating between orange and petrol blue, depending on the angle of light and the spectator's position in relation to the sculpture. Munir al Qadiri's sculpture, Alien Technology, alludes to the strange shapes of some of the most vital technical components of oil production, these drill bits. And despite the crucial importance of these technical structures, um, they remain unfamiliar and often hidden from view due to the fact that oil companies carefully control access to their operations and the oil fields. The title of the artwork, Alien Technology, also refers to the fact that until their nationalization, the extractive industries in the Arabian Peninsula were initiated and run by foreign companies and governments. The artwork's futuristic aesthetic is suggestive of an alienating nature of the built environment of the Gulf cities in some parts as a consequence of petrocapitalism and the accelerated building booms it triggered. Most importantly, the artwork reflects the challenges of petroleum's visibility or invisibility, which is fl a fluctuating aesthetic that hides petroleum's material omnipresence in our daily life. In this way, the sculpture investigates the visual and material complexity of petrol modernity through the phenomenon of iridescence. Drawing on Manir al kadirs artworks and artistic research, I de developed iridescence as a concept for analyzing the historical presence of petroleum in visual and material culture. Iridescence is the visual effect of a rainbow-like color play caused by light being reflected, and that is often happening in relation to oil that is dispersed on water or mother of pearl, so in shells and pearls. Iridescence describes, um, in, in how I use it, um, the aesthetic seductiveness of petromodernity. On the one hand, um, petroleum and all that it has brought forth stands um, for this visual promise of prosperity, growth, development that found its convincing expression in new and shiny materials like colorful plastic and new so sources of fossil energy that allowed for mobility, airplanes, cars. On the other hand, petroleum has impacted as a toxic destruction of social, ecological and cultural environments, often in the name of modernization and capitalism. Burning fossil fuels is was one of the main drivers of climate change, as we know, and to me, iridescence is both an aesthetic and an analytical concept to reflect on that ambiguity of petroleum. Coming face to face with the shimmering artwork implies to be mirrored in the shiny surface and to have oneself reflected back onto or into the surrounding. Iridescence depends thus on a viewer, on a viewing position. The sculpture's glossy surface can thereby provoke self-reflection about one's own understanding and affectedness from petromodernity's impact as both cure and poison. One's own position within the aesthetic, consumptive habits and ecological limits of petromodernity. Moreover, alien technology um, used to be situated in a heritage village and the artwork therefore invites reflections on petroleum as a heritage, as a cultural heritage for the Gulf. In fact, Petroleum is a conflicted heritage that we share across the globe. As a case study in my book, Kuwait serves as a microcosm to analyze a global phenomenon that is petromodernity. As a term, petromodernity defines a world since roughly the mid 19th century in which petroleum and other fossil fuel derived products have infiltrated everything from ways of living, politics, economies, but also architecture, images and aesthetics through which we experience and negotiate the world. My argument in a way is that thinking through modern architecture and urban space has long taken place um, in one way or another through petroleum. Kuwait and other Gulf states are a particularly interesting case in point because they not only consume like we all do, but also extract and export oil and natural gas. Moreover, the beginning of the industrialization um, since like the 1940s coincides with nation building and modernization that manifested in radical urban transformation of historical settlements. I think an important task of our time and our job as researchers is to analyze the ways in which our understanding of modernity has been intrinsically infused by petroleum, not only on a material um, and energy level, 
or economically, but also on a social, cultural, visual, and aesthetic level. From the motorized city to air conditioned houses or smart homes, from plastic as essential building materials to synthetic colors everywhere. In 1951, Kuwait's ruler Sheikh Abdallah Al Sabah engaged the British town planners Minofri Spensley and McFarlane for the very first master plan of Kuwait City that you see here. And depending on uh, what you're working on or, or who is participating, this might be quite a familiar image in relation to Kuwait's history. In order to develop this master plan, the town planners who were based in London and uh, who didn't know Kuwait worked mostly with aerial photography. In order to receive an accurate and up-to-date aerial view, um, the British company Hunting Aero Surveys was hired to conduct a comprehensive survey of Kuwait, for which an airplane flew all the way from London to Kuwait. The most important outcome of this survey was this photo mosaic that I'm showing here, for which individual photos were pasted together to form this big um, image. What role did petroleum play in all of that? And I'm going through several layers of petroleum engagement. In the Arabian Peninsula, aerial photography was first and foremost used in, used in the search for petroleum, starting in the late 1920s already. Oil companies considered aerial photography effective for analyzing the desert surface across the peninsula to identify potential oil fields. The British company Hunting Aero Surveys um, became a well-known expert in the region for its services in petroleum exploration, long before aerial photography was demanded in the field of urban planning. Moreover, petroleum played a role in the actual image making process. The specific airplane that was used, uh, that was flying over Kuwait um, was a so-called Percival Survey Prince. <laughs> and this uh, monoplane had been modified for aerial surveying by integrating a transparent nose, you see the error here, with two cameras. The photographer on board was shooting the landscape by remote control while looking through a transparent thermoplastic window screen made of the material called Perspex, which is similar to plexiglass and a material that is produced basically from petroleum itself. Of course, the airplane was also fueled by kerosene and consequently one could say that the 1951 photo mosaic of Kuwait is also as an image on the image level fueled by petroleum. Now, what do these images tell us about the relationship between aerial photography and urban planning and actual physical urban space? In the photograph that you see here, the total land mass uh, makes up around three quarters of the image. The fine grained um, texture represents the town of Kuwait as it was in 1951. And you, here you see a close up of these aerial photographs. In fact, um, it was a densely populated coastal settlement consisting of courtyard houses and surrounded by a town wall, to be very, very brief. The landmass with its various shades of gray contrasts uh, with the surface of the sea, which appears here in darker grays, but mostly black. The overall stark black and white contrast in the image makes the shape of the coastal land formation that is characteristic for Kuwait City stand out prominently against the dark background of the sea. In the photo mosaic, Kuwait emerges as a characteristic shape, like a wave pointed right. In the historic town enclosed by a wall, it is nested like an almond, um, sort of in this um, wave-like shape. If we return to the master plan, we see not only um, that the new metropolis was envisioned onto the layout of the historical coastal settlement. In order to build the new Kuwait city, the historic settlement was more or less completely demolished over the course of the 1950s to make way for the new city center. However, despite all that destruction that um, happened in Kuwait, there's a strong continuity of that urban form of Kuwait. Already the master plan integrates that shape that can be identified in the area of photograph. And also the, the black outline that in the aerial photograph is the, back, is the background, is the sea basically, is, I just go back for one more time, is also integrated in this drawing of the, of the future master plan. And I mean, it's not really necessary to have this thick black line here. Um, so I would argue, and I do argue, that this is also sort of a kind of transformation process from one image, the aerial photograph, to another, which is the master plan that 
comes out here. From here, one can trace a visual or iconographic tradition of depicting Kuwait City as an aerial abstraction, as a view from sort of like aerial space. The iconic aerial view reappears in all kinds of images and also in the 1950s, 1960s, became kind of like an icon, one could say, for showing Kuwait in various contexts. One example we could look at is the um, government gazette Al Kuwait del Yom, and on the cover, um, it was founded in 1953. You see the wave shaped urban core of Kuwait that is also outlined again by a thick black line connecting it back to the aerial photograph and to the master plan. The cover design of the gazette has um, actually not changed until the present day. Finally, one could also look at a contemporary satellite image on Google Earth um, that also again shows how much these um, historical images from the 1950s, the aerial photograph, the master plan is still imprinted in the aerial view of Kuwait to the present day. And I find that quite interesting on several levels. One would be that images actually are not just documents that represent something, but actually that images are agents I take a, play a very active role in the shaping um, of, of environments such like in Kuwait. The other one would be that in a way, I mean, if we look at um, sort of the pre-oil town that is depicted here, then we have a sort of imprint of that memory um, of pre-oil Kuwait still in the urban form today. There's a kind of a continuity, despite the fact that this continuity is, is also part of a process of destruction. And um, thirdly, that this sort of traces the tradition of presenting Kuwait and also other Gulf states um, in this aerial view from above that came out already in the 1950s. Another important image group that I looked at in my, um, in my book um, were photographic albums from the archive of the Kuwait Oil Company an Anglo-American company in charge of the oil production in Kuwait. What struck me was the fact that the archive, and there actually are two archives, one is in Britain um, at the University of Warwick, it's, the, it's part of the uh, uh, British Petroleum Archive, and one is in Ahmadi, is that when I was looking at these color images from the 1950s, early 1960s, and there are several, like maybe 20 um, photo albums um, that were produced at the time, that the majority of the photos did not show the oil industry, oil infrastructure, or Mina al Ahmadi, or Ahmadi as a company town, but rather Kuwait City itself. And I'm just giving you a few examples from these albums. By visually claiming, and this is my argument here, Kuwait's capital as part of its sphere of influence, one could say, the Anglo-American co company attempted to stimulate the acceptance of its own operations in the country by presenting the progress this coastal city-state was experiencing in very positive, in bright terms, one could say. Against the Suez crisis of 1956 and growing anti-imperialist and nationalist sentiments, the curation of its public image became a very important concern for the KOC. To this end, the firm engaged professional photographers to shoot Kuwait City in expensive, large format color uh, images. While these were definitely not the first color images ever taken of Kuwait, the, the quality, the format, the size, but especially the quantity of images was unprecedented. Color photography was crucial in conveying how the coastal village was apparently awakening to life once it started partaking in the consumerist lifestyles that petromodernity projected and that also that the oil company encouraged. A key motive were colorful modern cars, and you see two images here where sort of these um, bright red or blue colored cars um, contrast with the surrounding um, cityscape uh, in rather sort of like sandy colors. And I think this is quite a purposefully chosen juxtaposition. Another important element was showing the city at night. Um, and again, you see one photo here, um, basically that light matter for like Kuwait, being enlightened or Kuwait coming to light is also in relation to the medium of photography was very important. The expanding electrification that was also related to petroleum industrialization allowed for breathtaking pictures of the city, a site that many described with fascination. Um, 
The KOC's framing of Kuwait City not only with light but with photographic colors represents another um, important case in point of the visual seductive effect of petromodernity's petro iridescence. The company eventually commissioned the British industrial photographer Adolf Morat, who was British but of uh, German descent, to come to Kuwait in 1956. And I show a photograph of him here. Prior to his work in Kuwait, Morat had undertaken photographic surveys for other British imperial heavy industries, both in Britain, but also in uh, former British colonies. At the time, high quality color photography, just like multicolor printing, was not common in Kuwait and also not common in many, many other places. Most post postcards, for example, used photographs, but they were black and white and then hand colored. Morat returned in or came to Kuwait in 1956, 58, and 1960. And as I uh, described earlier on, I produced um, maybe a, a few hundred color photographs for Kuwait that he um, um, shot in Kuwait, but produced um, technically in, in London. And um, for many of these photographs, color was not a technical necessity. It wasn't necessary to have them um, in color. But color, and this is what I argue here, was part of an aesthetic rhetoric, and thus it was important to have them in this way. Morat's photographs were used for, and this is what I'm tracing in this chapter, were used for public relations outlets, either in the um, KOC Information Center that was in Ahmadi, so they were there, sort of like put on the wall, um, demonstrated how the company was working. Um, they were also put up as large uh, displays in the airport waiting rooms, as I found out. And they were also used um, to illustrate the small booklet called The Story of Kuwait that was first published in English and later in Arabic by the KOC. And that basically is quite an interesting document because it was sent out to stakeholders in the US, um, in Britain, but also in many Arab countries. And it uh, described the history of Kuwait, um, how it became a country, but it also um, sort of told that history of Kuwait as a company history in a way that um, it emphasized that the KOC was a crucial stakeholder, a crucial actor in shaping the way Kuwait City was, was transforming into in, in the mid 20th century. And for that also, um, out of Morat's photographs were used. The color photographs that um, Morat took of Kuwait City conjured up a petromodernity as a colorful, progressive and dynamic atmosphere, um, something that black and white photographs could not communicate. Color was indisputably better equipped to capture the blooming garden that surrounded the recently opened National Museum of Kuwait, for example. And in fact, um, the KOC framed Kuwait's history and its development in text and images, always with this metaphor of making the desert bloom. And as we all know, water is an important topic in the region. So having abundant water to actually create a garden, water it, and so on was strongly linked to that sort of petro-industrialization. Petro this perspective was, of course, a very selective representation of what was happening in Kuwait at the time. The fact that the destruction and rebuilding of pre Kuwait as the implementation of the urban master plan was on its way is missing from these uh, supervised representations is striking, especially at, as that destruction based on the master plan that I showed you before was omnipresent, very visible. This deliberate photographic absence in the oil company photographs becomes obvious when compared to color photographs taken by other independent uh, photographers. One example in point is uh, the work by Tariq Zaid Rajab, um, a Kuwaiti educator, school headmaster, artist, and photographer that captured, for example, the demolition of um, Kuwait's New Street. The walls of the former interiors spaces are painted in subtle tones and they are cracked open and also reveal the skeleton structure um, and the concrete structures. At the center of the photo, the view opens onto a mural of the world map and the scene of a man and a woman, probably illustrations to uh, entertain children. This photograph, in contrast, discloses that the houses under demolition are lift spaces for which their vanishing also erases the social memories of living in Kuwait. Moreover, it demonstrates that not only the pre-oil um, architecture was destroyed in the 1950s, but, but already so-called modern architecture from the 1940s, if it did not fit the overall concept. 
while Rajab's photographs have gained a new visibility, um, especially through several publications that he and um, his son uh, Siad have published in the last 10 to 15 years, um, and they're well known in Kuwait, Morat's uh, photographs were well received in Europe and the US in the 1960s. It can be assumed that the oil company supported him in popularizing this particular selective view of Kuwait abroad, either through exhibitions and brochures. And I'm just showing an example that um, he, for example, displayed his work in an exhibition in the Near East Foundation in New York in May 1961. And in these contexts, context, interestingly enough, it was never mentioned that these were photographs that he had taken as a commission by the Kuwait oil company or later by the Kuwait government. It was um, sort of like shown as artistic independent works, despite the fact that it was not. The color photography shot by Adolf Morat for the KLC and also others is a testament to the strong impact of oil companies on the region's urban visual culture. It is important to carefully resaturate these photographs in the oil archive and to disclose their provenance and political agenda. Um, and I really want to stress this here, all companies invested heavily in visual culture um, at the time in art as well. Um, and these Im images today circulate a lot in social media, but hardly ever it is mentioned that the KOC commissioned these works and that they actually have, yes, a kind of political agenda. The third main focus of my work was um, actually on postage stamps um, in this chapter and um, introducing you to them right away. So in 1959, the very first set of stamps depicting motifs from Kuwait was issued by the authorities in Kuwait and was valid for local and international use. Following the first oil exports in 1946, Kuwait slowly began developing its own political symbols, such as the government gazette that I've shown, the new um, coat of arms, a new flag, later also a current, uh, an own currency, but also stamps. This was not only a creative act, but an important political moment because the Kuwaiti-British negotiations over the creation of original Kuwaiti stamps and over the decolonization of the postal services became a catalyst moment for discussing Kuwaiti independence. This resulted from the fact that the new postage stamps broke with the long line of stamps previously used in Kuwait, which had been overprinted British and British Indian stamps. And I'm just gonna stress this here. I mean, this basically means mail that was sent from Kuwait had always um, a British ruler on top. Kuwait was not part of the in intrinsic part of the design. There was no Arabic on it, all that. There was no motifs that were coming from or were depicting Kuwait. So introducing this new set actually was quite an important deal. In stark contrast, each of the 13 definitives, uh, which uh, comprised the 1959 set, displays the country name in English and in Arabic. Um, also, and before the introduction of the national currency um, in Kuwait, um, the Indian rupee and its sm smaller denomination in Ayapaisi was used. The full-face portrait of Sheikh Abd Allah Sabah wearing official formal dress is integrated on the six lowest value stamps and in a small vignette on three others. In the stamps function as the receipt of an advance payment um, in order to ha have something shipped somewhere else, Abdullah's face value vouched for the stamps authenticity and validity. He did so not only as the ruler, but also as the distributor of the re uh, oil revenues paid by the Anglo-American oil company to the Sheikhdom. Being the treasurer of Kuwait's oil revenues, Abdallah played a crucial role in supporting, supporting the belief in Kuwait's petro-modernization in this period. If we, look at, if we have a look at the motifs, we can see images and scenes that depict the built environment in Kuwait at the time. A dhow, the oil harbor, the water desalination plant, an oil derrick in the desert, the mosque of Shweikh uh, Secondary School, and Safat Square. Kuwaiti collectors uh, and philatelists, which means uh, stamp specialists, um, such as Ali Al Rais, Fatim Khatihi, Khaled uh, Abdul Mukhni, have already undertaken a lot of research to find sort of the original images from which these stamps were developed. And I'm very grateful for their support and also for the conversations we had. Just going to show you one example. 
So we see here an undated postcard with a photograph by um, Abdul Reta Salmin, who had a photographic studio in Kuwait at the time that was hand colored. And this is more or less exactly the same um, sort of like frame and view that is used on the stamp. So from there, uh, one can see that the same vistas, the same images of Kuwait were uh, popularized at the time in either postcards or stamps, or maybe even postcards that had the stamps on the back. Um, it's often difficult to say which one was first, the postcard um, or the stamp, um, but we can say that the, the baseline for all of that were photographs that were um, taken in Kuwait in the 1950s. As a combined display on an envelope, as a collage of modern Kuwait, the stamps function as a mobile miniature travel guide um, that made the addressee a visitor to Kuwait through images. Stamps are traveling images, and I think this is a very important function. If we now try to situate what Kuwait was doing at the time with its first official set of stamps, then it's quite interesting to compare the Kuwaiti set from 1959 with other stamps from the Middle East um, that so somehow referenced uh, the oil industry. And what I found out in my book, um, what I'm presenting there is basically that with the first set, Kuwait used um, several stamps in this set to reference the oil industry through especially oil infrastructure, whereas other states usually had one stamp only, and often that was a stamp issued for a special occasion like the opening of an oil refinery, a refinery like Jordan, for example. Um, Kuwait instead had three stamps in this very first set that referenced the oil industry. Um, for that reason, um, one can say that the Kuwaiti government approved stamp designs that confidently showcased the country's present sites of oil production and other infrastructure projects that in one way or another were financed or even powered by oil became the new iconography of Kuwait. One could say that the Kuwaiti government proudly partook in petroculture and deliberately showcased its new status as oil producer um, to both towards its citizens as well as audiences abroad. At the time, and this is important to stress, petroculture became part of an official national identity, um, and political symbols that um, were promoted through postage stamps. So this is one explanation that we can say it was cool at the time to be an oil producer and um, Kuwait was very yeah, open and very proud about it and really made this part of its image campaign in the mid 20th century. For quite some time, and basically for the second or maybe for most of the 20th century, petromodernity was a promise for a better future. And this was also a belief that was heavily stimulated by images, um, such as images I have so shown you so far. But um, the experience of the 99-1991 Iraq invasion or the first Gulf War was, a crucial, uh, was crucial in changing how petroleum was received. It was basically a total rupture. When fire was set to the oil fields in Kuwait and um, infrastructure was demolished, gigantic amounts of oil spilled across the desert and into the Persian Gulf. Especially for Kuwaitis, but by default uh, for the region at large, the Gulf War and the images of burning oil wells imprinted a destructive, toxic side of petroleum that was so far unknown in the collective memories of the region. The Gulf War resulted in a devastating ecological catastrophe in the, in the form of smoke, oil fires, and oil spills, and represented a calamitous blow to Kuwait's political and financial viability. Equally important, this material and visual encounter with crude oil also forced a shift in the way that the fossil material was seen and valued. Oil was no longer the harbinger of political stability, prosperity, and social cultural development. Rather, it made many feel vulnerable and exposed, and the Iraq invasion created traumatic experiences for people staying inside and outside of Kuwait. But again, in an absurd and maybe sarcastic way, also this catastrophe conveys iridescence, a haunting yet mesmerizing or fascinating beauty and ambivalent, yeah, ambivalence um, as the photo photographs taken by Sebastian Salgado convey. Um, in, in that sense, iridescence captures that petromodernity has at least two faces, a face of progress, uh, happiness, colors, and a face of destruction, 
um, and both are linked to petroleum. With the full disclosure of petroleum's dark side during the Gulf War, the image world um, and the historic visual culture um, is now under scrutiny. For some, these historical images are a nostalgic retreat and refuge, um, and they are share many sharing, are sharing these images on social media. It's very popular to look back in time at that um, prosperous golden era um, of Kuwait and other places. For others, um, these images are a point of access from which to challenge the official histories of Kuwait and other Gulf states and from which to imagine alternative future scenarios and imaginaries. It is this spectrum that is currently negotiated in the contemporary art scene in the Gulf through artworks that deal with petroleum and notions of past, present and future. Um, because in the Gulf, petromodernity in its iridescent urban visual culture not only constituted the um, experience of modernity, but also coincided with and did partly determined the crafting of state images, national identities, and physical nation building. In recent years, a young generation of artists from the Gulf have developed works that question the ability and trustworthiness of governments and companies to project sustainable futures. In their artistic practices or research practices, many artists re-engage with the urban visual culture from the mid 20th century. Um, and the resulting art works are of particular importance to my book to understand what do we do with these images today. Some contemporary artworks by Kuwaiti artists and artistic collectives based in the region have constructed, as I see it, a form of visual response to the urban visual culture from the mid 20th century by reassessing the historical image world of Kuwait and the embedded narratives. I'm just going to show a few examples from my book that I'm discussing in the book. For the series Cultural Fair yesterday, Asila Yakub cut original Kuwaiti stamps under the microscope and assembled them into new collages. The resulting stamp yeah, images or collages um, are then displayed under a magnifying dome that stamps once used to be a novel and polit uh, politically important media for the Kuwaiti state is reinvented, uh, to reinvent itself is both revived, um, reactivated, but also questioned. Al Yaqub, um, in this particular image, which is called uh, the new Kuwait, Al Yaqub transformed a 1950s stamp um, that showed uh, the Kuwaiti desert, uh, Al Waga, into the set of a moon landing with one astronaut having planted the Kuwaiti flag. The artwork plays with the futuristic aesthetic of many stamps and the belief in infinitive um, progress and unlimited mobility. The composition provokes questions such as whether there might have been a, a Kuwaiti space mission, whether Kuwait has become impossible to live in, or perhaps whether the country has been transported elsewhere amidst unbearable climate conditions. Asil Yakub related to me the ways in which he had long felt a strong sentiment, an emotion, a kind of nostalgia for the 20th century oil period prior to the Iraqi invasion, a period known as the golden era. Another example that I find very interesting in this context is the work by Mohammed al Ku, who um, works with an analog camera and photographs buildings or locations in Kuwait that have been very important to that modern period of Kuwait but are now either already destroyed or um, are sort of in a decaying status. And through this process of image making, he tries to revisit these places, sort of curate the memories and also tries to keep them for future generations. Um, and he also says that nostalgia is a very important driver or motor or motivation for him. Um, that is a kind of ambivalent feeling. Nostalgia, as generally understood, develops from the idea that the past is no longer available, often springing from the sense of a rupture or discontinuity between past, present, and future. And I'm drawing here on the work, for example, by Svetlana Boim. I'm wondering, is nostalgia an uprising against petromodernity, an escape from petroleum's iridescent effect? Clearly, the longing sentiment for Kuwait's past that Ali Yaqub and other artists express through their work points to an ambiguity for the desire to return to the optimistic heyday of petroleum fueled and financed modernity. These artworks simultaneously state a form of resistance to that nostalgia. Looking at the Gulf today, there seems to exist a paradox shifting between the fear of running out of petroleum 
and the loss of building even grander. In this context, I also read Munir al Qadiri's sculpture um, that I showed at the beginning. If placed on a roundabout, let's just imagine that, if placed on a roundabout in a Gulf capital, it would be a perfect start for a visual, artistic, and also very public face-to-face -face with the Gulf's oil period and its lasting legacy. But the Heritage Village, I think, also proved an, intri an intriguing situation for that sculpture. The artwork Alien Technology became physically embedded in the now in an actual physical space in Dubai and became a kind of or can be re read as a monument to petromodernity. Potentially, maybe a way to say goodbye to oil once it's monumentalized. I would like to highlight that petroleum is not only a form of energy or income, but something that has affected art and architecture or visual and material cultures identities and memories. And as I said, Kuwait is a microcosm and a very interesting one um, to do that kind of investigation. But actually, it's um, you can also um, take this to many other places or basically everywhere ac across the globe, given that petromodernity, living with fossil fuel, is basically a global phenomenon by now. Moving away from oil also means to deal with this heritage and I think one way that we should not forget um, is to investigate that moving away from oil through images. And this is what I've done in this book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. This was a very stimulating uh, presentation. And I really enjoyed how through your book, you use uh, iridescence as an analytical concept to actually span a wide variety of subjects that go from the modernization uh, phase of Kuwait up to nowadays, uh, how the visual culture and contemporary art has kind of been trained to save uh, the role of, um, of oil. So I will just ask you uh, maybe two questions to uh, start the, the Q&A, and then after we will uh, take some questions. So for the question, please feel free to either you can raise your hand on Zoom, obviously, uh, or just uh, send the question in the chat box and I will uh, pass them directly to, to Laura. So my first question, so uh, in your book and your presentation, you have demonstrated that uh, petroleum uh, not only played an important economical, uh, economic and political role in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, but it was also crucial in shaping the visual culture, the art and architecture. So I was wondering if there are some other oil producing countries outside of the Arabian Peninsula where oil has played an analog role uh, in visual culture and especially because there have been a lot of uh, analogies that were traced uh, in academia between uh, the development on, so, of some uh, oil producing countries. So I was wondering if you have an idea if a kind of similar uh, phenomenon happened in some other oil producing countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for the question. So um, yes, definitely. I mean, there are several, like, several big regions in the world that um, sort of have developed into oil producing regions um, in terms of really producing and exploiting it um, nationally, but also exporting oil. Um, there's a whole research field um, de developing for the past, let's say 10, 15, 15 years, maybe that is called uh, petroculture studies. And there's a biannual um, conference that's taking place. And my observation is that usually the focus is, I mean, like probably everything, um, is sort of like on, on North America, so Canada and the US. However, what is actually far more interesting is to look at, um, for example, Latin America as another um, region in the global South, to look at how these narratives of oil have played out, how they've influenced um, aesthetics, visual arts and architecture. And um, I'm part of a research group that um, is made up of um, researchers that focus on the Middle East and on Latin America. And we try to sort of create this um, comparative dialogue, um, exchanging our material, discussing it, and trying to see where there are common grounds to see, for example, I, I mean, in my case, if iridescence is a concept that is only interesting to the Gulf, um, or if this is something that could also be applied to other uh, regions. 
but definitely, I mean, in terms of regions where oil played a role in shaping um, everything from national identity to art, um, the Latin America would be a really interesting example to look at. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, my second question, and after we'll take a question from Alexandre Guyot. Uh, so uh, in your book, you also speak about the um, fact that, of course, petroleum is a finite uh, product. So at some point, we might run out of it. Also, we are very not sure when will that be. Um, but uh, have you observed whether in the field of contemporary art or in the wider field of uh, visual culture, if um, the idea of a possible rupture of oil in the region uh, has started maybe to create a new kind of visual culture that is based not on oil, but on the uh, anxiety of running out of it? Hmm. It's difficult to say. I think it's always difficult to work on something that is happening right now um, and to be sort of like, yeah, have a, a critical distance and be, yeah, um, sort of like um, scientifically analytical about it. But what I'm observing at the moment is definitely that this discourse on oil um, in terms of the, as a destructive force of um, ecology, so sort of like um, eco art, um, let's say, is definitely taking place um, and also very much so um, taken up by artists from the Gulf region um, or working more or less on the Gulf. Um, I've, I've brought some examples if you want to look at this at, at some point, but I think it's what, what I see is shifting is that sort of one is so that nature becomes a motif or an object of engagement to question, yeah, where are we living and how is this currently transforming? What are the signs of transformation that are happening now? And um, is this, I mean, and I think in the Gulf, it's especially interesting in this um, yeah, negotiation between nature and um, sort of artificial environment maybe. And of course, that there we, we can't draw these narrow lines anymore saying this is untouched nature and this is an artificial environment. I think this is, I mean, we've overcome this point uh, completely, but rather to question where do we want to live in and what living conditions um, are happening. And I think the, the interesting point is that on the one hand, and again, we are coming back in a way for me to the idea of iridescence that oil is needed to make certain environments livable, but by using fossil fuel again, so if, um, we are destroying that environment at the same time. So, I mean, if we just take up that notion of air conditioning, for example, um, I mean, what, what we're gonna do uh, without air conditioning um, in, a, in a time period where there's no fossil fuels? Of course there are alternatives, but is that a way we want to live in that's another question i think so yeah i think nature as a motif or yeah as an object of of inquiry is uh, has become much more important over the last five years i would say thank you so much